Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tokyo Living Podcast. Um, from time to time on the show, I, I'm going to get people on to, to talk about some martial arts and combat sports. I know in uh, episode 12, we had Brian McGrath on. Um, you know, obviously, uh, combat sports and martial arts is a, is a massive passion of mine. And uh, in Japan, there's there's few people that are better to talk about this topic than this man here. Uh, Keith Vargo, welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. Nice to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, we could probably spend uh, the whole show just talking about your, your background and your career, but uh, perhaps if you can give the, the listeners a, a somewhat brief uh, summary of your, of your background and, um, yeah, what, what brought you out to Japan? Uh, well, I got into martial arts um, pretty early, like junior high school. Um, mm. And uh, it was, you know, from the age of 13, 14 on, it was uh, um, kind of a passion. And... Uh, uh, I always describe it as, you know, like my interest in other sports just fell off of a cliff once I discovered yeah. judo and, uh, right. yeah. And then, you know, just went on from judo to karate to, um, uh, sort of Jeet Kune Do, uh, program I was involved in for a while. And, uh, and then after I graduated from university, um, I knew I wanted to live abroad and, uh, um, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, I came from a small town in Western Pennsylvania and uh, um, I don't know, I think uh, for a lot of people who come from small towns, it's, um, it's uh, if you have larger ambitions, then sometimes you kind of overshoot a little. So I ended up <laughs> <laughs> not just going to a bigger city, but to an entirely different country. And that's, you know, I just really wanted to get outside of, um, you know, my own, um, I don't know, not just to say my own upbringing, but you know, you want to get outside of your own culture and your mm. own way of looking things and just see things from other points of view. And I, I knew I wanted to live abroad for just that reason. And, uh, you know, couple that with, uh, the interest in martial arts and Japan was, a a natural choice. Yeah. Makes sense. So you, you started off in judo and, and then sort of moved on to karate and, uh, yeah. yeah. And then Jeet Kune Do, to be honest, I'm, I'm not, obviously it's, uh, uh, it stems from um, Bruce Lee's teaching, but uh, is it something that's quite big in the United States? Because I, I don't believe it's it's super popular in Australia. Um, but what's it pop? Yeah, what's its popularity like in the states? Yeah, um, although I, I went through through that that program, that was actually uh, something I did in university. So, uh, mm. um, yeah, like it was uh, almost on the outside of of what people consider mainstream Jeet Kune Do, I'd guess, right. you know, but um, um, yeah, like uh, it's, it, it's popular, but uh, you know, of course it was never as popular as things like, you know, karate and judo and Taekwondo, especially in the 1980s, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. because uh, back then in the United States, you know, much like, like with, um, um karate now and you know some of the other sports that were being introduced in the olympics um yep. you know there was the 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 1984 olympics in los angeles and then 1988 in seoul so taekwondo had a big push in the united states back then so yeah that that was everywhere you know <laughs> in the 1980s yeah, yeah. and uh you know you know, judo and karate and taekwondo, those were kind of the big ones. But Jeet Kune Do was always around. And because of Bruce Lee, um, there was always uh, a lot of interest in it. I always thought that there was more more interest in it from people outside of Jeet Kune Do than there were actually people doing Jeet Kune Do, you know, at really? the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I haven't, I haven't lived in the States for quite a while now. Sure. So I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are for people practicing it or that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just interested. Um, and so, then, yeah, what, 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 uh, what sort of work were you doing when you came out to Japan? Um, teaching English, yeah, that's yeah. Like like most people, I'm 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 an ESL teacher, and that's 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 uh, like my main job. So, um, so I my day job, I teach I teach ESL, and I, I started at Kaiwo like other people, and uh, eventually I started teaching in universities, and uh, that's where I've. Uh, that's what I've been doing for, wow, is it almost 15, 15 plus years now? I can't remember exactly how many. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, what sort of martial arts? So uh, I'm assuming once you came out here and started teaching that you um, were keen to get uh, to continue your training. Um, what sort of things were you doing at that stage? Uh, well, well, when I first uh, came to Japan, I was in Hokkaido for a year and uh, um, in the town that I was living in there, uh, I I just jumped into whatever I could and, you know, anybody that would let me come to a practice, I'd, I'd do stuff. And uh, mm. so I tried out Shor Shorinji Kempo and there was a kendo class there and of course judo and there was a, a budding Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, well, it was kind of like jiu-jitsu and shuto yeah. mix kind of uh, club. And uh, yeah, there was actually a guy there who was an amateur shuto champion who uh, taught and uh, I used to run into him at the, the just this local fitness center, kind of like he'd be lifting weights at the same time as me. So it's, yeah. that was always kind of interesting. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I sampled a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, I went and I watched a, a lot of other stuff just to, to kind of see, you know, what's for you, right? And uh, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it was fascinating. Like um, the first time I'd seen Iaido, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, the first time I'd seen Kudo done and... Yeah, it was it, like uh, we were talking before the uh, before we started recording about um, the things that are different from what you imagine, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the Aido class was the you know the sword. For those who don't know, that's the art of sort of like quick draw art of cutting with a sword, kind of like draw yeah. and attack. And uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of older guys, you know, maybe middle aged to you know senior citizen kind of thing, but. Uh, what really impressed me was that they were all so careful with those swords, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's one of those things that should be obvious, but, you know, <laughs> well, no, just watching for the first time, it was like, there, there was no messing around. They were, because, they, they, you know, they're essentially three foot long razor blades, right? So, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really something to watch, you know, the deliberate care with which they always moved the first time I saw uh, an EI no class, so. Yeah, yeah, it was really fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I know uh, quite a few foreigners actually take up uh, Yado when they're in Japan. I think it's um, it's something that's it's probably much more difficult to find uh, outside of Japan than it is to find the Karate or Judo uh, Dojo, for example. And I think it's also something that's um, maybe not quite as intimidating. So rather than going somewhere and getting punched and kicked and thrown all over the place, um, it's a little perhaps seen as a little less, a uh, little more gentle and, uh, and something that's um, yeah, a little easier on the body, yeah, but also a, a little less intimidating. Um, so it's, 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 it's interesting. And I've, I've actually treated a few patients that have had uh, so injuries just from, I guess, the you know, different nature of, you know, long sustained positions and yeah. those type of things um, and, and different, um, you know, wrist and elbow uh, stress of, of holding the sword and, and moving it through different ranges of motion. But uh, yeah, I've, I've actually found that it's quite popular out here with, with foreigners. For sure. For sure. And uh, uh, rightfully so, because, you know, um, if you come to Japan, you know, they're there's so much to do here. There are so many different arts and it, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up in any of them because they're all special and they all have really unique, unique histories. And uh, they're, they're really things that you can't find anywhere else. You know, yeah, it'll be one of them. Yeah. And, uh, and like I mentioned, Kudo and other things, but, uh, but ultimately I decided, you know, that um, the fight sports were really for me because yeah. I had done some, some, you know, some competitive judo and the, the Jeet Kune Do stuff that I'd done in university was more based around the kickboxing aspect of, yep. of Jeet Kune Do. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It was fascinating, but not, not exactly my thing. Right. Yeah. And uh, I guess you sort of touched on there, um, Iaido being one of those things that was a little bit different to what you expected. Um, either in terms of like specific examples or just as an overall theme of martial arts in Japan, compared to what you'd experienced in the States and, and what maybe you were expecting, were there any sort of major standout differences? Oh, uh, there's, yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the, the number one thing I think that, that, um, that surprises a lot of people when they first come here, like if you're a martial artist and you've, you've really got caught up in it in your home country and, you know, 
you get really dialed into the art itself and that that is your entree to japanese culture right but for a lot of japanese people martial arts are just not a thing at all you know that yeah, yeah. you know they they know what karate is they know what judo is and kendo and some people do it or they did it in a club in high school or stuff but it's not yeah. it's not like you will find as many people that share your interest in that as you would imagine because you associate it with japanese culture in general yeah because you know, that's I, I, that's how you became introduced to it yeah i can remember listening to a japanese uh, stand-up comedian ages ago who, who was speaking he was doing his comedy in english but uh he was saying that when he traveled overseas and said he was japan from japan people would go oh you must know karate <laughs> like it's sort of <laughs> got that type of stigma to it that it's uh i guess assumed to be a little bit more of a, um, a part of society in Japan than, than it actually is. I think the, the example you gave in your book was um, if someone was coming to the United States and they were a, uh, they were obsessed with what do you get, like gun drawing, sort of oh, yeah, yeah. Wild West style <laughs> gun drawing. And, you know, it, that would be perceived as being, uh, you know, a little bit strange. Yeah, exactly. Like um, for, for a lot of Japanese people, this is just history, right? Yeah. So that, you know, if you're like, Yaido is the good example, because it is kind of a quick draw art. So that if, like, if you were living in the American Southwest and you met this, this Japanese guy who, you know, he's just all around, just a nice guy. And everything seems like, you know, he just seems like a normal guy or average guy until he, you know, he lets you in on the fact that he's really into these, this, you know, old West style of drawing a, gun you know gun fighting like quick draw you know like and maybe he's learned you know he's learned how to do it he's you know watched a whole lot of westerns and then he came to japan he really wanted to do that you know and you know you wouldn't you wouldn't think he was there was anything wrong with him but you'd think like well that's that's a really <laughs> idiosyncratic hobby you know <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah i think a lot of people look at at us like that because you know um yeah, that's that's our entree into Japanese culture, and so it's it's a lot more intense for us than it is for them. So, for sure, yeah. And what about in terms of the training itself? Um, I mean, for me, coming uh, in Kyokushin Karate, coming from uh, Australia to Japan, the biggest thing that I notice, and, and what every most other people notice, is just the. I guess the simplicity of it and the focus on basics and repetition, which I think is just sort of a part of Japanese culture, just doing the same thing over and over again is, is very much part of what, what people do here. Um, and also just on, you know, people will come and, and think that there's going to be, you know, elaborate, um, you know, training methods, but also elaborate dojos and, and gyms. And uh, I know Brian mentioned in a, in a podcast that uh, he did a, a couple of days ago that um you know often some of the most famous gyms and dojos in in japan are actually quite small maybe a little rough around the edges and uh and sort of not at all what you'd expect um and i've sort of definitely found that, that that that's the case but also in in training it tends to be just repetition of the basics over and over again and i think that uh in japan you can sort of get away with teaching martial arts that way whereas mm. in the west people you know, just uh, aren't willing to do that type of training. And uh, it's probably not, yeah, as effective for uh, for foreigners as it is for, for the Japanese. Um, yeah, I don't, don't know what experiences you've had with the actual training itself. Uh, well, yeah, th there's there's definitely that. And, you know, I've, um, when I've done some, some more stand-up, some of the stand-up places, you know, that I've, I've visited or trained at, you know, it's like they, they, they cleave to the basics, you know, pretty close. But uh, also, um, I will say that uh, it, it depends on the art, you know, because, uh, you know, like the, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu places I've visited here, you know, like uh, they seem as, as likely to be interested in the, the complex technique as they would be in the States or, or other yeah. places, you know. And, you know, it is really kind of fascinating, you know, how you can, you know, bait someone into doing one thing and then switch up and roll them roll into a back back mouth position on them you know and yeah. I, i've seen you know like people really really be into that and uh sometimes i wonder if the coaches are just like yeah maybe you should work on the basics more you know, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know and, not, and i'm not saying just jujitsu but you know like just different arts you know you'll you'll see that some people are really into um complex techniques so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
And where did you sort of progress from from there uh, with your own training? Because I know you, you did uh, compete in MMA. Um, how did you sort of make that that transition? And, and yeah, what's what's your sort of training um, journey been like over the last couple of decades after arriving here? Okay, well, um, yeah, from the time I arrived in Tokyo, I, I, I went looking for one place, and that was Takata Dojo. And that was because, you know, Kazushi Sakuraba was there, mm -hmm. right? Because, and this is to, to, to get the timeline right, it's like first I was in Hokkaido, and that one year that I was there was kind of like his breakout year, right? And uh, yeah, so so when I arrived in Tokyo, was right, and 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 I found Takata Dojo was right before his uh Sakuraba's match with who was it, High and Gracie, I think. Christmas okay. match where he came out dressed as Santa Claus and that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, um, so while I was there, you know, he was the guy, right. And yeah. when I showed up in Tokyo, I was like, well, I want to be able to do that. Right. <laughs> and so, so I went looking for Takata Dojo and, uh, and it was like a full spectrum uh, mixed martial arts gym at that time, you know, and, you know, they had like, um, at first it was a Shidokan kickboxing coach. And then they had guys they brought from Thailand who were coaching. And of course they had, you know, the, the submission wrestling guys, like Sakuraba and the rest of those guys who made the switch from pro wrestling. And, you know, there was a lot of that sort of catch influenced technique mm -hmm. that was part of the submissions, but, mm -hmm. but really it was, you know, whatever, whatever it took to win. Right. Cause right. They were they were they were based on pro wrestling. That was really what they had learned, where they had learned how to fight, grappling on the ground, that kind of stuff. I mean, well, a lot of them had like backgrounds in freestyle wrestling or Greco-Roman or something like that as well. Right. But uh, a lot of times, the submissions they learned had come from you know guys like Billy Robinson or somebody else. You know that 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 sort of uh, pro wrestling catch wrestling influence. Yeah, interesting. And what what was it like? Uh working with Sakuraba and uh what, what was he like as a person oh he's he's he was funny and he was charming um um it, it was like uh he taught one class every Sunday and uh um I tried to make that as much as possible um and um you know my Japanese was no great shakes so you know I was tried to follow as best as I could but you know it, it was like at the time you know it's it's wrestling so you know, you don't have to have a huge amount of explanation to understand what he's doing. But there were times where, you know, when he's talking about, well, what you want to do is you want to do this here and then you fake this way and then you do this and that kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah I had some people that at the time were nice enough to help me out. And yeah, yeah. They, but the unfortunate part is that, uh, I don't know if you remember it, but after the High and Gracie win that he had, it wasn't it wasn't long after that that Sakuraba fought Vanderlei Silva the first time, and so the the downside of that was that you know he had some really savage fights and he'd be injured and wouldn't be able to teach you know, right. rightfully okay. so you know he was he was fighting step some, in the ring you know, with uh, <laughs> Vanderlei Silva you're not going to be yeah back in yeah. class the next day exactly so you know there's times where you know you'd show up on Sunday and hope, you know, like, well, it's been a couple of weeks, you know, but yeah, sometimes he was there, sometimes he's not. And you know, eventually he'd come back and he'd teach, but there was like stretches where, you know, he just had to recover like anybody yeah. would from those, that level of fighting. So, yeah. you know, although I, I got to, to learn from him, it was, you know, there were, there were, there were a bunch of gaps in there too. So, and, and he did eventually leave Takata Dojo too, about halfway through my time there, because yeah. I was there in around 10 years, I think. Okay. But, uh, yeah anyway yeah um i guess uh, if we can sort of just break and, and then start to talk a little bit about um your writing career and, and how you got into that oh. um so how did that sort of come about about uh, um compulsion i guess <laughs> <laughs> is it yeah is it something you'd, you'd sort of wanted to do for a long time or well it's just something i did i guess is yeah that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm being mildly sarcastic about it, but it's, it's only like half joking, but uh, it's just something that I always did. Like uh, yeah. 
my my mother claims that I was reading and writing when I was two years old, and I don't know about that, but there was never a time where I don't remember like just scribbling in a notebook. Yeah. And and that just continued with whatever I was doing. And so when I got a big interest in martial arts, I remember, you know, I'd get books out of the library, I'd have my notebooks and copy things over that I wanted to remember and have my own thoughts on it. And those things just just naturally developed in time as you as you mature as a martial artist and you try to figure things out and you learn new things and and sometimes there's questions that your instructors can't answer for you and you know uh i think it's like one of those uh, zen parables where you mm-hmm. you eventually become the answer that you're looking for you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that uh, eventually you know i all these things that i wanted to find out or you know i i i, I went and looked for them myself and then i started writing about them and then um <clears throat> <clears throat> my uh, when I was in university, uh, one of my friends was um, uh, Robert Young, who eventually went on to become the editor of Black Belt. And so, when well, actually, first he was the editor of Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, one of the smaller uh, sister magazines. Yes. And when he was uh, when he needed some content one time, he asked me if I wanted to send something in, and uh, and to my surprise, he actually published it. You know because. From my point of view, it was just something out of the notebooks, and then, right. and then once once he showed that level of confidence in me to, to give me a try, then I, uh, I don't know, maybe I became a little more responsible, or uh, I re- I really tried to write something that I felt was reasonable and interesting and worth reading uh, because he was willing to give me the chance and put mm-hmm. me in Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, mm-hmm. and uh, then when he moved over to Black Belt Magazine. Uh, he took my my monthly column with him, and uh, and so then I was uh, writing for Black Belt just a monthly column for seventeen years. I mean, wow! Yeah, and yeah. for uh, a lot of the listeners that that might not um, be in this space, I mean, Black Belt Magazine is. Uh, sort of like the the Time magazine of uh, of martial arts. It's a it's a massive deal. I know we're growing up, um, you know, studying martial arts as a young child. It was always uh, you'd sort of go into the news agents and, and look for that uh, Black Belt magazine to come out each month. Uh, I know uh, we had a local magazine, uh, as we, we talked about uh, before we started the, the recording, the, the Blitz magazine, which was a uh, yeah, local production. Um, and, and Black Belt magazine was, uh, because it was brought in from the States, it was you know, double the price. So it sort of had that prestige to it. Yeah, you know, so if I had Sorry my pocket that. money after buying Blitz, <laughs> I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd buy the Black Belt. But um, yeah, it's, it's um, obviously a, a massive worldwide uh, publication. Um, so how long, so when did you start writing for them? Uh, well, I started writing for Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, I think it was 1993. I think right. 92, 93, I can't remember. Um, and then uh, that was, uh, you know, bi-monthly, like every two months it came out. And uh, and then when uh, when Robert Young moved up to um, Black Belt in 97, I guess, then 97 or 98, I can't remember exactly anymore, but then um, he took my column with him and I started writing for Black Belt then. And by then, um, uh, was it, well, around that time, I, I moved to Japan for the, the first year I was in Japan. So um, I was actually, I actually lived in Finland for a couple of years before, because I was oh, wow. teach, as an ESL teacher, and that was sort of okay. my, my, my detour for a while. So I didn't go directly to Japan. And uh, right. yeah, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a whole other podcast, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Um, but in any case, then, yeah. So, yeah. so the one year I was, the first year I was writing for Black Belt, I was actually there and then came to Japan and yeah, then, then I was writing all kinds of things because I was here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I guess, yeah, over that time, the, I guess the topics that you were writing about or uh, your sort of perception of the uh, combat sports and martial arts scene over, over here, um, how did that sort of change? Um, um, because I guess you would have been here during the explosion of the, the massive K1 and, and Pride era, which was, I guess, uh, 
well, well, it was, a, it was a, a massive time. I sort of arrived here uh, at the end of 2004. And, uh, mm. you know, when I told someone that I was a competitive martial artist, the first thing that they asked is, oh, when are you going to sign with Pride? Is it, you know, is your goal to get to Pride? Like, <laughs> and these were just, you know, patients that I was treating in the clinic who had no idea of combat sports. It was, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was it was massive. What um, And then things just sort of changed. And uh, for whatever reason, those organisations um uh, uh, sort of yeah. went away and and Japanese combat sports uh, as you've sort of written about in your book is um, still massive but in uh, in much smaller organizations and a lot of different organizations yeah um, yeah, yeah. How, how, what are some of the big things that you've seen in, in your time here in terms of the, the change in those trends yeah that's uh, that's that's a big question but uh, um, the best way I can say it's like, um, I, I, some ways I feel like I'm like this forced Gump character that just sort of happened to be there at certain junctures when certain things happened, you know, that, you know, if you look in certain photos, you'll see me in the background there or something. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's sort of thing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like um, I was there for some of the early pride shows, you know, and uh, um, well, okay. First, just for, for the maybe, not everybody has a sense of history that we do about, you know, the development of combat sure. sports, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but just as a reminder to everybody that the UFC didn't show up until, what was it, 90, yeah, 92, 93, right? And so it was, you know, less than 10 years between when the first UFC was and I showed up here and the first Pride was 97, 98, I can't remember now, but uh, okay. yeah, but that was pretty soon afterwards. And so it was, it's hard to describe to people, you know, how new all this was and how, how wide open it was. You know, you, you really didn't know what was going to happen a lot of times when you tuned in, you know, <laughs> and that was the case in the early UFCs, you know, the almost uh, Vale Tudo style rules and, and to, to an extent with pride, but, but there was this, this convergence at the time of like the rise of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the sort of popularity of pro wrestling and mm. uh, K1 was the, just the top of the food chain as far as, you know, sports, fight sports, you know, especially yeah. media wise, you know, they were on, yeah. they're on terrestrial TV, just, just killing it. Right. And so all of these things were coming together. It's just this, this one moment in time, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to describe to people like what that was like that you, know, you would go to shows and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have these sort of predictions of like everybody sort of knows what the technique is because so many people have done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or something like that. You'd show up and you'd have like um, uh, Bob Sapp pile driving Noguera or something like that. <laughs> you know, you'd have like some of these these pro wrestlers like you know run out of the corner of their ring and just literally do a drop kick, just like you would see in studio wrestling, like right at somebody's yeah. head. You know. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, the whole thing was just so exciting and it was just wide open and you never quite knew what was going to happen. So the, the whole thing was just really exciting. And because there it was, there was a lot of interest. There were a lot of competing organizations. And so, you know, K1 and Pride occasionally would work together, but they were also competitors sometimes, especially mm -hmm. like on New Year's Eve, you know, yeah. <laughs> those two shows and, you know, Inoki, uh, Antonio Inoki, you know, probably the most famous pro wrestler in Japan, he would have his, his own fight show that was part pro wrestling and part, part uh, MMA. And yeah, and so there was, there was all of that. And, and then you, you'd see like that there was, there were, there was like some settling down into pattern eventually, you know, but, but the, the, the amount of spectacle that it was here, I, I just, um, I don't think that, that it was achieved for a long time outside of Japan, quite like yeah. that, you know. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to ask you, what, what do you, if you went to you know, a massive Vegas show, whether it's a uh, boxing or, or UFC or um, yeah, c compare that to like, yeah, the, the enormity of uh, a massive Pride or K1 show, you know, you know, in that sort of era, I mean, how does it compare? I, like, it, it sort of seems like it was so crazy and so popular in Japan at that time that even what the USC are doing now just does, doesn't compare. Yeah, see, like I said, I haven't seen 
the more modern UFC shows. And I know they, they have some pretty big crowds these days, you know, but, uh, but uh, the way I always uh, described it to people is that it was like arena rock in the 1970s, yeah. you know, that, and I mean that both in terms of size, you know, because you know, I was there in 2001 for the Tokyo K1, the Tokyo stadium K1 pride joint show. Like 90,000 people or something. Right, right. Some people say it was 70, 75,000. Some people will say it was like 85, 90,000. But either way, it was the biggest show I ever seen for an MMA, you know, promotion. And it's, it's, it's just hard to describe. Like I said, Arena Rock in the 70s. Imagine going seeing Led Zeppelin in 1975. That's, yeah, yeah. that's how huge it was. And, and also kind of like the, the, uh, just the the air, you know, the atmosphere of the place, just the um, the charisma of it, you know. That you know, when you when you had those guys coming, you know, like walking down the ramps and and you know the big music coming, fireworks and everything like that, and 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 the, and the people that they were fighting, you know, when you had McGuire and Sap, you know, there was a payoff after you had that big intro, you know, and that was like one of the best fights you will ever see in your life kind of thing and there it is right in front of you kind of thing <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i know when i'm on on ufc fight passes for you know, multiple documentaries and there's one that uh is talking about when they took uh chuck waddell over to um to japan to do that uh, combined i know it was a combined event or it was just entering chuck into pride where he had to fight um i think he started with overeem and then i think he fought wonderlay and then who did he lose to? Come on. Wow. Yeah, I think he got got to like the final of this event and then ended up losing. Um, he might have lost to Wonderlay. Anyway, but yeah, da- the way Dana described it was like in that that time, early night, early two thousands. You know, the USC was still relatively small. They were still doing relatively small shows in the states, and and just coming over to Japan and being in these massive stadiums, not just arenas, but stadiums. It was like he said, it was like a a massive rock show. Um, and uh, and probably overwhelmed Chuck Liddell. He just hadn't been sort of exposed to that amount of hype before. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and to be fair, that you know, for as great as Chuck Liddell was, you know, because it was the place where you know the most money could be made. There was there was a murderer's row of guys. You know, yeah. there's there's no shame in losing any of those fights. Those guys were all great. You know. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, um, very cool. Um, but yeah, like in, in terms of, of like the way it developed, you know, it was it was just like that, like like Arena Rock in the seventies, and like like that too. You know, it it had its end, and um, yeah, like uh, I'm, I'm sure anybody who wants to can read about you know the Shukan Gendai scandal and all of that other kind of stuff about the business side of it, and and. Uh, uh, I was I was never as much interested in the the sports business side of that. So if anybody wants to read about that, there are people who are much better writers about mm-hmm. that. That they can find that out there. But but yeah, once that happened and Pride disappeared and K one K one is uh, it kind of went away and then it came back and it mm-hmm. you know it's been it's gone through different owners and yeah I, I'm I'm not sure exactly what happened with that, but all I know is that it it is still around and it actually had a sort of resurgence in the past few years. So, yeah, 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 but it's uh, yeah, definitely definitely nothing like it uh, was before. Yeah. No, nah, no, nah, it's not nothing like that sort of you know, you know, prime time TV that it was in the '90s and early 2000s. That was yeah, yeah. Like the, the one of the the examples I give is that my my wife, who's a kindergarten teacher, you know, like her her kids, you know. Would, were sitting around eating lunch one day and they were like arguing over who who was the, the strongest person in the world and some of them were like Ultraman's the strongest Superman was strongest and you know this was the time of Bob Sapp and so, so then they were decided some of them decided no Bob Sapp was clearly the strongest man in the world and I, I always use that as an example to show you the level of yeah, yeah, popularity yeah. and saturation that K1 had is that even kindergartners knew who Bob Sapp was yeah, and saw his yeah, fights, yeah. you know? Yeah. That sounds like a, a conversation we'd have at dinner with my six year old who's, <laughs> who's obsessed. He's gone from being obsessed with uh, Superman and, and the Hulk last month to now it's all WWE and, you know, who's, who you would go. win out of John Cena and the Rock? <laughs> um, 
Okay, just going back to your, your writing. So um, you were that sort of Japanese correspondent for, for Black Belt magazine. Um, I understand that you've written books as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, um, uh, well, okay, I, I had, uh, currently I was writing a monthly column and mm. reporting on different fight shows. And, uh, yeah, that was a pretty busy time. So that, uh, um, I have this, this big archive full of, uh, um, you know, of old columns and old fight reports and interviews and profiles and stuff like that. And so um, in 2008, uh, Black Belt Magazine, the Black Belt Publications published the first 10 years of my columns in a book called Philosophy of Fighting. And um, uh, then, then later, after that, it, it, it did well, I guess. But uh, then I, later I took the rest of the columns and see behind me, I got this book, that's The, the Soul of Fighting, and that's when I self-published uh, with the remaining columns that weren't in the, that first book. Okay. And uh, yeah, and, and a lot of that stuff is, you know, the, the, the stuff about observations about um, traditional martial arts in Japan, as well as um, uh, what the lifestyle is like here, what training is like here, you know, different things like that, as well as some fight sport things. And uh, the, in the future book that I, it's taking me forever is actually the fight sport articles. So all of those K1 and pride reports and all those interviews is going to be a separate book uh, called Kaktogi Boom because that's that's what it was called at the time for for people who might not know kaktogi is just a general generic term for fight sports and the kaktogi boom was the time where yeah like k1 and pride and mma was just everywhere all the time and was super popular so um yeah that most of those articles were written during that time so uh i'm trying to pull all that together into a, a cohesive book and I want to get yeah. that out there soon. Fantastic, and I um, and I also understand you've been um, involved in uh, translation of a, a, a early boxing book. So that's that's one of the kind of fascinating side projects I was lucky to be involved with. Is uh, there's a prolific translator uh, here named Eric Shahan. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but uh, um, I met. I met Eric um, at a, actually, interesting enough, I met him at a lecture series about Don Drager. I don't know if you remember him, but yeah, yeah so Don F. Drager was kind of like the original guy who, who came here and studied Koryu martial arts, the really old fashioned style martial arts, as well yeah. as judo and, and everything, you know, karate and everything. And he wrote the, the seminal books that kind of defined martial arts for for everyone in the English speaking world for you know about two decades I'd say at least and uh, yeah. so I went to some some lectures and I met I met Eric there who was sort of like internet friends before that and then uh, you know afterwards you know when he usually what Eric translates are are these uh, really old and kind of obscure books on Japanese martial arts. So he has some, some rare books on, you know, karate and kempo and jujitsu that he's translated. And then he came across this uh, old boxing manual written in 1923. And because boxing isn't his, his thing, he's more on the traditional martial arts side of things. Um, he asked him if I wanted to be involved in it. And yeah, I kind of jumped at the chance because, you know, like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to be involved in something like that without, uh, without someone as dedicated to translation as Eric is. That's, a, that's the best way I can put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it was really nice to be involved in that. And uh, I, I wrote the foreword for the book. But, uh, but yeah, the book is, is all Eric's, really. You know, I, I helped a little bit with formatting and you know, some suggestions about you know, like how to translate some things about the technique, like when you're talking about boxing technique in English but but really it's 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 all his it's his baby and he did a great job with it and uh yeah that just uh got published uh last week or no this week this week yeah. right okay yeah interesting um and are there any other sort of projects that are out there that uh that you think people 
uh, would be interested in that uh, you've been involved with? Uh, no, those, those are the main ones. Like, the uh, ones yeah. if, like this book right here is available on Amazon right now. And uh, my first book is there as well. Uh, so like I said, the first book was Philosophy of Fighting. And the, um, uh, the second book is Soul of Fighting. And the third one that I hope to complete this year is going to be called Kotogi Boom. Okay. Reports from the golden era of pride and K1. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah. That, that, uh, you'd be very interested to read that when it comes out. Yeah. And I guess, um, given what you've sort of seen since you've been training and uh, writing about combat sports and martial arts out here, what, what do you see sort of happening in Japan in particular over the next, say, 10 years? I guess both in terms of traditional martial arts and also in terms of fight sports. Um, they actually in the, the content that, uh, that you sent me, that was, was that, that was excerpts from uh, Soul of Fighting or Philosophy yeah, yeah. of Fighting? Soul of Fighting, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'd yeah, recommend uh, anyone to, to pick that up. It's a really interesting read. Um, the first part was uh, when you talked about um, Jeff Broderick and uh, how... Um, he is a, a Yaido master and um, one of the things that I thought was interesting that he had a, uh, I guess, a, a slight jealousy of MMA practitioners because they actually get to test their skills for real uh, as opposed to uh, Yaido where you're not doing that. You probably shouldn't be, <laughs> uh, you know, like a real life uh, self-defense situation. Um, well, yeah, like, I, I see, that's the thing is like, uh, I... Uh, I may, may try to make it clear in the article that like nobody you know, wants to see people actually fighting with swords again. You know, least of all somebody who actually is an expert in swordsmanship. Yeah. But, um, and you know, it, Jeff, I think was being a little bit generous, you know, um, but uh, the, the point was that you, you, you know for certain, you know, whenever you, you, you punch or you kick somebody, you know exactly what that means and you're in a, like a Kyokushin dojo or a boxing gym or a kickboxing gym or something like that, right? But, you know, there's, there's some question about, you know, technique because you're not actually going to fight with swords with somebody, you know. You, you wonder how much of the information is, uh, is accurate compared to when the, the art was first made, you know. That there's a natural entropy of information. And, mm. and I, I think what Jeff was was kind of getting at was the the certainty that's that's what he envied but i'll tell you what like uh and i just said so in the article is that i actually i envy the hard one knowledge that a lot of those guys go through because they they really have to become bilingual historians and sort of like kinesiologists in a way and mm -hmm. they have to become this multidisciplinary expert to to really clear out some of the the things that are that are i don't know not falsehoods that's not the right thing but the entropy that naturally drifts you know your technique away from what it originally was you know yeah. and uh yeah so i i envy them a lot you know the the dedication and the hard one knowledge that they have because honestly like what what we do is like the low praying hanging fruit you know like yeah. you go out there and you just you, you you throw hands and it's it works or it doesn't you know <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, it right? exactly yeah yeah but yeah i guess there's different layers to it and i think that the it's almost like you've got this um interactive moving history lesson every time yep. you're you're practicing right um and i think that it's it's probably something that from a, a tri yeah somewhat traditional martial art like uh Kyokushin, we sort of get some of that as well um, and to different degrees depends on which which you know where you are in the world and, and even within different countries and different organizations within different dojo you, you have some that are you know, very sport orientated uh, and some that are very martial arts orientated and you know if you are going to be a successful competitor you've got to prioritize the time spent on that sort of competitive aspect um, but I think that having yeah the ability to practice something that that has that historical element to it um i think is is really important it's something that you know, i enjoy and i'm trying to get back into as i'm yeah no, i shouldn't say phasing out my competitive career was long behind me i still like to think of myself as a competitor and because you know i'm 
spent a lot of my time in sort of sports science and looking at performance and ways of optimizing performance. I, a lot of my headspace is in instilling that sort of sports mindset, but um, I find myself sort of over the last uh, few years trying to focus a little bit more on the, the martial arts uh, aspect because that's where it, where it all started for me at least. Yeah, well, actually, um, that's one of those those things where sometimes uh, it feels like a false dichotomy, you know, that, mm. that there's this sort of um, philosophical aspect of, of martial arts and then there's the actual fighting that you do. And uh, uh, one of the conclusions that I came to, like, when I was younger was that that all of that philosophy, all of the good things, all the morality, all this you know, questioning about the nature of being all comes from the ability to hurt someone to begin with. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that stuff doesn't automatically make you wise or moral or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it kind of forces you to think about those things. Yeah. If you're a normal human being who's not a psycho, you, you, you know, yeah, like yeah. I can remember the first time I actually like, you know, somebody didn't tap you know like when i was in judo when i was very young you know and you you hear their elbow kind of crack and then suddenly mm -hmm. you think like what, what am i doing here you know? <laughs> and then you, you really think like this is well, this was just a game up to this point you know like ah, oh, i got you and you tapped right you know mm -hmm. but then then you actually hurt someone and then you realize that no, this is this is for real and then you gotta you start to think about what it means to be able to do that and to be a good person and and so all those things kind of go together, um, I feel like. And that's, that's actually one of the reasons why uh, in the books themselves, I probably to the point of, you know, people get tired of me saying it in different ways that I think everybody should sort of like have some kind of competition, some kind of test of what they do, yeah. you know. And yeah, it doesn't have to be like, like high level, you know, killing, killing it in competition, like international level or something like that. Just just something so that you really know this is what I can do. And that's why I, that's why I have this philosophy that guides me, you know? Yes. Yeah. No, very cool. And, uh, and I guess it's sort of for the future of fight sports. Um, do you think we'll ever see a second, uh, second cup Toby boom? You know, I honestly can't imagine it happening yeah. quite like it did before because that was just such a special convergence of, of, of business interests and history and, you know, um, the development of different martial arts themselves, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wonder, one of the things that I, I, I mentioned about that, um, I think in the books is in the upcoming book is that, um, you know, when you think about the development of, you know, like, karate and judo in the west and um the the road that it took from being very non-competitive to, to sort of like point fighting to kickboxing to and all of that like late late 80s was when kickboxing really started to hit mm. you know, the, from the late 70s to the 80s you know that's like it went from like the long pants karate, you know, like full oh, contact yeah. PKA, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To to like really Muay Thai was kind of becoming a thing then by the late yeah. 80s, partly through Jeet Kune Do people. And, and then Gracie Jiu Jitsu hit the late 80s, early 90s. And then, you know, you had pro wrestling was rising to heights that unbelievable heights through the 80s and 90s, especially in yeah. Japan, you know? Yeah. And, and all those things came together, you know, at, at the same time, you know, like martial arts wise, as well as, you know, sports entertainment wise. And, uh, and you just had so many talented people and so much interest just all from the, the common person, just the average person, just all converging at the same time that I, it's hard to imagine, you know, like that happening quite that way again. I mean, the interest is always here in Japan and I think in mm. the States and everything like that, but but like I said, like Arena Rock in the 70s, there's only, there's, a, there's only one time where you can have that first time where everybody's discovering all these things all together at once kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I guess just finally, um, uh, the time of recording here, we've just uh, finished the Olympics yesterday. Um, did you manage oh, to catch right. any of the, uh, the combat sports at the Olympics? Uh, only, only a little bit, only a little bit. I saw some of uh, 
the judo competition, like Aaron Wolf's, you know, march through the yes, yeah, the, what, over seventy five. I can't remember over hundred uh, under under hundred. I think uh, I can't remember Aaron which Wolf. weight class it was, but uh, but no, he was uh, under one hundred. Yeah, he was awesome. Just great consistency. And yeah. I saw I saw some of the wrestling. And yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, yeah. How about how about you? Did you catch much of it? A little bit, yeah. I guess more judo than anything else at the start. And uh, I think it was it was good to have the judo at there at the start and for Japan to do so well to sort of kick things off on a, uh, a positive note for them. I think that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, we had karate in the Olympics for the first time. Uh, it's very yeah. different to what I do. It's, uh, you know, that point system karate, um, which, yeah, it's, it's, it's I think... For me, a closer rule set to Taekwondo than it is to, you know, knock down uh, Kyokushin rules. Um, but I think it's still great to have it there and, and have that awareness around karate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I remember like uh, at one point trying to describe to someone the difference between the styles as like, like if you see kickboxing, that's not what this kind of karate is. This is more like fencing, you know. Like <laughs> yeah. You get in there and you score your points, but you're not... Like like in fencing, you're not going to really try and shove that foil the whole way through somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then interesting seeing that the boxing uh, we had uh, Australian got bronze. I think it was the only Australian combat sports medalist. Um, had uh, Harry Garside in under, I think under seventy uh, under sixty seven kilos, under sixty three kilos, um, put up a great performance, uh, which was mm. great. Um, and seeing, I guess the I was just talking to to Brian and other colleague Ross uh, earlier about the. Um, the difference in amateur boxing, Olympic boxing now, it's 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 much more yeah more similar to pro boxing without the headgear, with the um, uh, ten point round system as opposed to the uh, the point system. I guess it's uh, it probably makes uh, the transition from amateur boxing to pro boxing a little bit faster, but uh, it's, it's it's quite different to the sort of point system style boxing that, that was used to used to see. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I wish I had time to watch a lot more of it, but uh, you know, life, yeah, same, life yeah. is, gets in the way. <laughs> oh, actually, now that you mentioned it, when you talk about amateur fighting, um, you were asking me earlier about the the difference between, you know, or the development of fight sports over time. One of the, the things that um, I, I like is that you know, amateur mixed martial arts is is more developed now, you know? Because, um, um, like, when I, I first was doing this, you know, uh, there was basically Shuto that had an amateur, yeah. you know, MMA, you know, feel. Like, they had, they have their three levels, A, B, and C level, you know, so that, you know, if you were C, you're an amateur, and then B, you kind of move up a little, and then A, you're a pro, right? Mm. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that's, there's, there's a lot more amateur out there. There's a lot more development. There's a lot more doing that instead of you know somebody just happens to be a really good jujitsu guy or a really good wrestler and just toss them in and see what happens Mm -hmm. that was really exciting at the time but it probably wasn't the best thing for a lot of those (laughs) athletes you know and i mean i i actually i did the amateur mma here i was in i was 30 years old first time i did like i did an eight-man tournament and uh, that was actually on tv tokai tv's pre-pride tournament and uh And uh, yeah, there was some guys in there that, like, they were they were just awesome. Like, um, his name escapes me right now. Uh, uh, Yushin Okami. He oh was, yes. He was, yeah, he fought. He fought in pre pride as well. Not not the event that I was in, but the the subsequent one. And he yeah, nice. of course he won it, right? But you know, there was there was Yushin Okami in there, and then there was other guys, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> and just imagine you were the guy that drew Yushin Okami in your first fight ever. You know, and that was yeah. like. Yeah, that's actually, that was kind of rough back in the day. Actually, you know? <laughs> drove past uh, Yushin Okami uh, a couple of days ago, just on the street in uh, around the corner from uh, from uh, the gym. Actually, yeah, he just walked oh, yeah. down the street and still yeah, looks yeah, like a very mean, very uh, very capable man. <laughs> no, he's he's still in the mix. I think he's got a fight coming up in one championship soon. So yeah, yeah. but uh, but yeah, like that's that's one of the big developments is that I I like the idea that people are having amateur careers. A mm. little bit before they they get they get tossed in there, you know. With, For sure. Uh, you know, more serious fights, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that's been fantastic chat. Uh, okay, really appreciate your time. Um, 
for anyone who wants to sort of see the, the stuff that you're putting out there, um, I know that you've got an Instagram handle is uh, at Keith Varg or underscore author. Is it Keith underscore? Well, uh, just one famous word, you know, Keith Vargo author. Okay. That's on Instagram and yep. there's Keith Vargo author on, um, uh, on Facebook and I've, I've got a website, you know, which is www.keithvargo.org. Yep. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, and Amazon page, of course, like everybody who's, who's got some books, there's, there's an author page on Amazon as well. Terrific. So yeah, just a, a recap of those titles. So philosophy of fighting, soul of fighting, both of those on Amazon mm -hmm. um, and uh, cut Toby boom, hopefully by Christmas. That's, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. <laughs> and uh, the book I was involved in with the translator, Eric yes. Shahan is called a quick guide to boxing. Um, and it's a translation from uh, Yujiro Watanabe. I can't remember his co-author's name off, off the top of my head. But uh, Watanabe was the, the father of Japanese boxing. He was yeah. the first guy who came here, started a professional gym. And so that's, that's why his, uh, his boxing manual is, uh, is a kind of a real gem. Um, and, and also, I, like, I get into this, if you, if you go, you can go on Amazon and my foreword is part of the, the preview and uh, talks about how he actually couldn't, um, he couldn't get into white gyms in the United States at the time. And so his, uh, yeah, his trainer was a black American named Rufus Turner. And so it's, it's actually kind of a special book that like almost just an accident of history that this ends up being uh, a special record of, you know, what he learned from Ruf, Rufus Turner, Ruf Turner in the early 1900s. So it's this, this special like um, time capsule of, of boxing at that time that was mm -hmm. part of another side of America, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So wow. yeah, it, it, yeah, it was really kind of a special thing. That's why I was really yeah. eager to be involved. In it. For sure. For sure. Oh, that's awesome. Well, um, yeah, as I said, I really appreciate your time uh, this afternoon, Keith. Uh, and hopefully um, once all this uh, mess is over with the pandemic, we can uh, hopefully catch up in person and um, you know, have a beer and hear some of the, the stories that uh, maybe aren't suitable for a podcast or a book and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, tap into more of your, uh, your great knowledge and, uh, and, uh, and experience out here. So, um, yeah, thanks very much. Well, thanks, Sam. It was great. Great to be part of this. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Sounds good. Okay. All Thanks. right. Take care.